Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I hope you can all hear me okay. Just give me a little thumbs up on the screen if you can hear me. Okay, excellent, excellent. All right, before we begin, I just wanted to let everyone know that this will be recorded. And after uh, we start recording, then I'll give an intro. All right. Well, hello everyone and welcome to a special, special presentation titled John James Audubon and the Birds of North Park Village Nature Center. The Chicago Audubon Society, North Park Village Nature Center, uh, we are excited to have Dr. Mark Poled from DePaul University present his work that highlights John James Audubon's paintings of birds found throughout North America. My name is Ryan Vance and I am a program specialist at North Park Village Nature Center. Uh, if you've never been to the Nature Center before, we are located on the far north side of Chicago at 5801 North Pulaski. Tonight, uh, we will highlight how the efforts of our volunteer stewardship, our educational outreach and ecological restoration have impacted the diversity of bird species uh, that visit the Nature Center. And then after that, our special guest, uh, Dr. Polet from DePaul University will share his work on the brief history of John James Audubon, his paintings, and the birds that frequent the Nature Center. Everyone will be on mute for this presentation, but we will take your questions uh, for Dr. Polet after his presentation. So we're gonna get started now. And I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. Um, so since we are focusing on a lot of the birds that are at the nature preserve around North Park Village Nature Center, it's appropriate that we acknowledge that the nature center is on the ancestral grounds of the Council of Three Fires, the Padua, Potawatomi, Ottawa, and Ojibwe nations. American Indians continue to live in the region and Chicago is home to the country's third largest urban American Indian community which still practices its heritage and traditions, including care for the land and the waterways. We give this land acknowledgement because we talk about the history, because when we talk about the history of a naturalist, we need to be cognizant of the historical and social context of that time period and the impact it has left on us today. Now I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Liza Fischel, another program specialist at North Park Na Village Nature Center. And she'll, she'll uh, share some information about our stewardship and educational opportunities at the Nature Center. And then she'll introduce our special guest, Dr. Polet. I'm good? Yep. Okay, awesome. All right, thanks, Ryan. Um, and thank you everyone for coming. Uh, someone just reminded me to let everyone know that the chat is on. So again, if you have questions, please add them in the, um, in the chat box. Um, I just wanted to share a little bit of information about some background between the Chicago Audubon and the North Park Village Nature Center. Um, it's been one of the longest standing relationships between, um, uh, with the partners for over 40 years. Uh, the Chicago Audubon and the Nature Center have, held, uh, have led spring and fall migratory bird walks through the nature preserve since the 1980s. Um, in recent years, birders have been submitting community science data about their observations to the website that's called um, eBird, which we'll also have available for you if you're interested in participating. Uh, in partnership with the Chicago Audubon, we've held engaging presentations like the one we're having tonight. Uh, with guest speakers, which are free to the public. Uh, we also have binoculars available that are donated by the Chicago Audubon that are free for any visitor to use. Uh, a little bit of background about the stewardship and education efforts. Um, in terms of bird initiatives, uh, the restoration and education programming at the Nature Center go hand in hand. Uh, the past and current restoration efforts invite all visitors, birds and people alike, and have been in place since the land use changed from the tuberculosis sanitarium to the preserve you observe today, uh, which is 46 acres comprising of four Illinois habitats, the woodland, the wetland, the prairie, and an oak savanna. Uh, one of our wonderful bird walk lead leaders is Joe Lill, 
who was also the past president of the Chicago Audubon, and said that from 1978 to 1986, 149 species of birds had been documented in the preserve. And in 1994 and 95, we did major ecological wetland restoration to the pond where the surface area was increased and the shoreline, shoreline was defined. Joe noted that since the restoration work of the land, management, land manager, uh, Bob Porter, and dedicated volunteer stewards, 27 additional species have been welcomed. Another partnership opportunity uh, with Chicago Audubon and Open Lands takes place uh, through a school program like the Birds in My Neighborhood. Uh, this is where the fledgling students are involved in discovering birds and how learning about birds at home and in local natural areas gives flight to environmental awareness and future stewardship. So I'd like to take this time uh, to present our speaker, Mark Polad. So many of us have made personal connections with nature that leaves an impression. I invite you to take a minute and take a deep breath. I'm going to take one too. I'm nervous. <sighs> um, to think about a moment in nature that you've had that has had meaning for you. Um, this takes us to our presentation of Mark Polad's Bird's Eye View of the Landscape of the Preserve. And I'm happy to welcome and introduce our guest. Dr. Mark Polad is an art historian from DePaul University here in Chicago and his family have been friends and frequent visitors at the Nature Center for a long time. As a bird watcher himself, he attends Saturday morning bird walks with the Chicago Audubon. And in his presentation, Mark combines his knowledge of art and his love of birds to describe what you might observe at the Nature Center. Mark states, it's like bird watching through the lens of Audubon's art. So with that, I'd like you to take a moment uh, remind to you so that you can see the screen. Uh, would you please um, go ahead and minimize your image tiles um, so that you can really see the beauty of this presentation and the art that follows. And Mark, ready when you are. Thank you. Thank you so much, Liza. Hello, everybody. It's so good to be with you. And I really hope you and your family are safe and well and happy Cinco de Mayo. I'd like to thank my wonderful North Park Village Nature Center colleagues, Liza and Ryan Vance, whom we've met, and at the Chicago Audubon Society, Antonio Flores, and the president, Judy Pollack. I'd also like to thank Marjorie Priest, who has led those Audubon walks at the Nature Center on Saturday mornings in the last few years. In fact, you know, that's such an inviting friendly group. All, all you have to do is just show up at eight o'clock in the morning in the parking lot. And so I'd recommend everybody consider, consider attending those walks when they resume next April and May. Now, this is absolutely the perfect time of the year to watch and be interested in birds. First, because of migration, uh, which means there are many, many more species here than at any other time of the year. And bird watchers, of course, love the warblers that come from the Southern Hemisphere as they make their way um, to Canada and a few up to the Arctic Circle. But secondly, because bird watching is a really healthy and rewarding thing to do now during the pandemic. So believe me, <laughs> the birds are out there being themselves, arriving by species according to their schedule, and they're looking great uh, in all our new clean air. So the bird watching has been wonderful so far, and you know that if you've been out uh, already. All right, North Park Val uh, Village Nature Center is slightly less than 50 acres. But it has, as Liza said, an incredible diversity of bird habitat, two ponds, marsh areas with a boardwalk, prairie areas, an oak savanna, woodland wetland trails, swales, actually. Um, I had a, a wonderful encounter with some uh, swamp sparrows in a, a, one of the swales. And then out front, uh, a native plant garden where I always do really, really well. In fact, <laughs> you know, in the, the bird group, uh, the Audubon bird group, you know, sometimes it's hard to get out of 
the parking lot. And that's, I, I know that's a real cliche with bird watching, um, but it's a fantastic area to watch birds, whether you're a beginner or an advanced twitcher, as the British call bird watchers. On some Saturday morning bird walks with the Audubon Society in May, we see as many as 50 different species. Uh, thankfully, and, and wonderful for us, village staff members, Ryan and Liza, have been opening and closing the park gates. But if you come too early or, or, or miss it, come late, don't forget to look for birds in the, the plant garden in front and then around the grounds of the nearby North Park Village residences, and then also at nearby Peterson Park. So for the next few minutes, I'll be speaking about Audubon's biography, his art, his writings on ornithology, and some common birds of the Nature Center. And we'll stop after about 20 minutes for some questions, then continue for another 10 minutes after that. We'll finish up with our birds, check in on Audubon at the end of his life, and share some additional resources for you to pursue. Does that sound okay? So I think no matter what your level of knowledge is about birds, you'll take away something you find interesting from this presentation. Here's a, let's start with a portrait of Audubon by a, an art, artist named uh, John Syme, S-Y-M-E. And it shows Audubon the way he marketed himself, actually. This, he wanted to be seen as a frontiersman. And even when he was successful uh, in Philadelphia and New York and London and Europe, <laughs> he dressed this way to encourage the exoticism of what he was. And in fact, this. This is probably a little nicer than he actually did dress when he went out in rural Kentucky and in the South actually looking uh, for bird specimens. Um, he was born in Haiti, actually, the son of a ship captain, a French ship captain, um, and he was born illegitimate. His mother was actually not, not Haitian, she was French. Uh, and uh, later, uh, when Audubon went back to his, his native country of France, his mother uh, adopted him and adopted him as, as her own. Um, the elder Audubon kept having mixed race children with other uh, Haitian women. So Audubon had stepbrothers and sisters who were mixed race. I don't know how many of those he knew. Um, he, uh, went back to France um, when there was a slave revolt in Haiti. Um, and as the revolution went down, his father was a member of the Revolutionary Guard. But as Audubon came of age, um, his father sent him to America. And in fact, he arrived in 1803, the same year as the Lewis and Clark expeditions, which is kind of interesting because Audubon is part of that, that great sense of naturalism and discovery in the American West. So here's a, a photograph of the Audubon uh, property just outside of Philadelphia. It's at a place called Mill Grove. And it's just one of several Audubon museums in the United States. There's a couple of plantations in the South that, uh, that set themselves up as museums for Audubon. But Mill Grove in Pennsylvania is where he came of age, learned to love birds, and um, eventually would travel uh, with his wife, Lucy Bakewell, who I'll show you her, because his story is indispensable, is, is intertwined with hers. She's indispensable to his project. There would be no John James Audubon without Lucy, and we'll get back to her. But I just wanted to show you this map. He determined to open a store in Louisville, which meant a long journey down the, across Pennsylvania, down the Ohio River to Louisville, and then eventually made his way further west to Henderson, Kentucky, which is just south of Evansville, Indiana, just across the river from Evansville. And there he set out to document 
<laughs> this, this is so ambitious, it makes me exhausted just thinking of it to document all the birds of America. But at first, he was a store owner, and he did pretty well, actually. He has a, a really interesting biography. Um, um, he's always in love with birds. He has a couple of daughters with Lucy, both of whom pass when they're very, very, very young. Two sons, makes his way back to Philadelphia, invests in a, a scheme for a steam-powered mill, grist mill, which bankrupts him. He comes back to the West, uh, dissolves his partnership with uh, another man for the store, and then starts, uh, determines to make art his project. Now, he will never be just a, an artist naturalist. He will always be teaching art, teaching dance, teaching French, making portraits of people in the streets of New Orleans. Uh, he's really scrounging. And this, this is why Lucy is so important. She takes care of the children, uh, maintains a home in Henderson, uses her family money to fund uh, John James's project, et cetera, et cetera. She's magnificent. You know, a lot of historians remember her because she gave away all the copper plates of Audubon's prints. Um, but remember, those copper plates weren't by Audubon. Audubon made watercolor paintings of American birds, and those paintings were made into prints, and that's what we call Audubons today. Now, there were other bird artists, um, Mark Catesby in England in the early 18th century, and here's an example of Alexander Wilson's work from um, the early, late 18th century, early 19th century, he had embarked on a project to make every American bird, and he did several hundred birds as well, and worked towards a project called American Ornithology. And in fact, there's a really interesting moment. Who shows up at the store in Henderson? Alexander Wilson one day. Audubon looks at his bird uh, uh, paintings, realizes, my goodness, these are so good, <laughs> but I can do better. And in fact, uh, Wilson asks Audubon, would you be a subscriber? Can I count on you to buy the bird prints that are based on these paintings? And unbelievably, I love this about Audubon, he demurs, he says, no, not interested, thank you, good to meet you. But yeah, I think, you know, in his head, he realizes, my God, I've got to get better than this. And he does. And that's another aspect of Audubon. He keeps getting better and he grows as an artist. And we can chart that progress. In fact, Audubon burns some of his earliest efforts. That's heartbreaking to an art historian. But he does, he gets better and improves. And it's, it's unbelievable. And I'll just say this once, and then I'll stop uh, being so flattering to Audubon. Um, his ambition, his industry, his self-discipline is remarkable. And that's, you know, apart from his art, that's what makes him admirable. <laughs> so I just want you to look at this Wilson for a second. These birds are dead, right? <laughs> These pictures are, are birds that have been stuffed. Audubon does that too. He's, he's a, a taxidermist. He earns some of his money that way a little bit later. Um, but Audubon's prints are full of life. They show birds that are alive. Yes, Audubon goes out, blasts a bunch of bird specimens, brings them back to his, his home, his cabin, finds the best one, wires them up, makes them look natural, then uses his considerable skill in animal behavior to make them look natural. Okay, here's what Audubon is famous for. Huge, huge prints. He couldn't get them made in Philadelphia. He went there first with a big bundle of his paintings. Um, and because he had insulted more or less Alexander Wilson, the scientific community and publishers were kind of arrayed against him. And somebody gives him, actually a, a man whose last name was Napoleon, <laughs> interestingly enough, 
tells him, brother, you got to go to Europe, go to Europe. And so Lucy's money helps him with a, a transatlantic trip, goes to London, uh, goes to Scotland at first, and he meets uh, an engraver who will do this work. And, and what that means is that someone takes an Audubon painting, turns that into a pencil drawing, gives that to an engraver, the engraver scratches that drawing onto a copper plate, then it can be inked and made into a paper print. Then it is hand colored, sometimes by women and young girls at long tables, each with a different color to make these beautiful, beautiful prints. And at first, this gigantic double elephant folio which was published by a man named Havel, the birds were actual life size, which is stunning. They're actually life size, which means he has to fold up the birds like a spoonbill that you see here, or a heron, an eagle, a turkey. They're actually life size. Now, here's the point where I tell you, Audubon was the most important and well-known naturalist artist of all, not just the most important bird artist. He worked at a time before photography so that his paintings were not just beautiful and dramatic, they're deadly accurate, lifelike, and real science. Now remember, he's working just after the Enlightenment when Europe was fascinated by the exotic New World of North America and when there was a mania for cataloging everything, right? Uh, Audubon grows up in France partially and sees the French encyclopedia, these ambitious projects. Let's, let's make a book of everything, right? I'm gonna make American birds, every American bird I can, 435 of them. And then later another 60, another 50 for good measure. It's just, astounding, these projects. So the real paintings, Audubon's paintings, are at the New York Historical Society in New York City. And if you want to see the paintings on which the prints are based, you go there. And here they are, they're large scale. These are from that elephant folio we saw. And then recently, I don't know if any of you did this last year, our own field museum, had a little uh, exhibition that had a real copy of the elephant, double elephant folio. There you can see it in the middle ground. And behind it, a case with a stuffed ivory billed woodpecker. It's kind of cool. Um, I, I am embarrassed to say I missed this exhibition. It was just in this one little room, but it was magnificent, apparently. And just to give you some context, um, the, the double elephant folio, there's 120 of them in existence. One sold last year, no, 2010, for $11.5 million. Um, the most expensive book ever auctioned was the, the Scientific Diaries of Leonardo da Vinci. That was like 53 million. But it's interesting to note that the last most expensive five books to go to auction have all been by Audubon. It tells you how we esteem these books that are by artists. Now, Audubon wanted to avoid having to supply every British uh, library with a copy of his beautiful double elephant folio. So he produced this book. This is an ornitho ornithological book he made with another man there in the center, a man named uh, McGillivray, Thomas McGillivray. And this has the long title of Ornithological Biography or an account of the habitats of the birds of the United States of America, blah, 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 accompanied by, and then skip down, in, interspersed with delineations of American scenery and manners. Those, I'm gonna be reading some of, of this to you on the birds we see at North Park, some quotes from each of the book. So this is the book that was supplied to the British libraries to avoid having to give the beautiful double elephant folio to all the, all the libraries of Britain. Um, I also want to mention 
we're in the romantic era in European art. This is when artists are fascinated um, by animals as exotic creatures, animals that have emotions, express terror, like this one. This is a painting by um, George Stubbs of a, a lion attacking a horse. And you can see this new feeling for nature, for animals. And this is the time of Beethoven, Goethe, Wordsworth, Edgar Allan Poe, right? This is an era of incredible emotion. And one of the great achievements, achievements of, of Audubon was to imbue his, his birds, not just with life, but with drama, with emotions and personality. And in fact, I got to tell you, <laughs> When my friends and I were younger, um, we knew that Audubon describes the, the common blue jay as an egg stealer, a bird that attacks eggs and stabs them and sucks eggs from other nests. And we couldn't get that out of our mind. I still can't get out, that out of my mind. I've never seen a blue jay do that. But one day, maybe I'll, I'll be lucky enough to see it. But that's what I think of. I think of Audubon's descriptions of birds. So I, I really have been seeing birds through his personalities, the ones that he's, he's given to birds. So let's keep all that in mind and let's get into some of our birds of, uh, of uh, North Park. The last thing I'll say is if you're a, a Audubon print collector, you know Audubon later when he was really successful created a much smaller version of, of the Birds of America. This is called the Octavo version from the 1840s. And Audubon went back, made new, new paintings uh, for all the birds. And by the way, here's the a wild turkey, which was the first bird of the double elephant folio. And um, these are smaller prints, six and a half by 10, 10 inches. And you can, you can tell what edition you're looking at by the bottom margin. You can see at the top, the initials of the artist that helped him with the plants, because he always had artists helping him with plants and background. And then you can see at the bottom left, his signature. He was so happy to be a, let's see, fellow of the Royal Society fellow of the Linnaean Society. Actually, only another American, uh, Benjamin Franklin, was a member of both those societies. And then on the right, the publisher, and uh, it reminds us that in the Octavo version, these are lithographs that are painted. All right, here's Audubon speaking about the humble robin. He says, the first land bird seen by me when I stepped upon the rugged shores of Labrador was the robin and its joyful notes were the first that saluted my ear. The look of the landscape excited the most melancholy feelings, but the song brought with it a thousand pleasing associates. Uh, I couldn't refrain from shedding tears, and I thought of the beloved land of my youth, and I was inspired with the resolution to persevere in my hazardous enterprise. And I'll just remind you, Robins are the national birds of Great Britain. Um, the male and female look very similar, although the male's a little blacker and larger. Uh, robins can get drunk on berries. Some bird watchers say they've seen robins stumbling and, and falling if they've eaten uh, fermented uh, fruit. And in the past, robins were killed for their meat. Um, uh, lots of people ate robins and all and a lot of songbirds for that matter all that ended with the migratory bird act of 1918 and i'll just recommend a great book john young's recent what the robin knows it's excellent excellent and finally um you can see these birds throughout north park there's no one place um, although they flock in the very late winter in certain places these are wonderful birds um, and and I just love, I love robins uh, for their song. Okay, let's do a couple more here before we, we break. The great blue heron, Audubon tells us, let's pause a while, good reader, <laughs> and watch the heron. How calm, how silent, how grand is the scene. Um, 
Look, he moves, he's taken a silent step and with great care he advances. Slowly does he raise his head from his shoulders and now his formidable, bi formidable bill has speared a fish. He gulps it down his throat. Now his broad wings open and away he slowly flies to another station. Um, these are the largest heron in North America. You recognize them when you see those long legs straight out behind him. Um, these fish eat, eat everything, not just birds, they eat insects, mammals, um, uh, rodents if they can, bullfrogs. And these can be seen in the West Pond, usually on the South Shore. Okay, usually in the West Pond, if you can visualize that along the South Shore. Let's do one more bird here and then we'll take a break and take some, some uh, questions. The yellow-bellied woodpecker, and these are the old names. The new names, uh, the post audubon names are in brackets. Oops. Um, some facts about the sapsuckers. Um, they attack living wood, actually, and they can kill a tree. You've seen the rows of girdling, the, the holes that they make, which occur uh, in trees in rings around the, the, uh, the body of the tree. They have an unusual tongue, which has a spoon-like end, uh, and they feed their chicks with insects, which are occasionally coated in tree sap, uh, which sounds wonderful, actually. <laughs> How kind of them to offer their children, you know, bugs dipped in tree sap. And then the major predators include raccoons, snakes, actually, that get up into the trees. Um, my wife and I actually saw this happen just last week. A raccoon walked across the street here in Evanston, slowly climbed a tree, walked up to the hole in the tree, reached its hand in and then put its head in and was gobbling uh, eggs, we imagine, and hopefully not little baby uh, yellow-bellied woodpeckers. You can most often see these at North Park in the deciduous mature trees near the center and then in any mature trees throughout the park. They're very, very beautiful, especially the, the juveniles as they, the, as the juvenile males. They're very, very bright and, and beautiful with the red and the yellow. So, all right, I am gonna stop here and let's, let's see, let me stop the screen. Do I need to stop the, the stop sharing the screen to get out to, to Liza or Maybe I can look at some of the, no, let me stop the share. Liza, can you see any really good questions? Anybody chatting? I saw, I saw some nice comments about um, bird migration uh, and when, uh, when some of the walks might resume. And then we also had a really nice question too, a curious question from Forrest Cortez. Uh, wondering if Audubon had a favorite bird. Oh my goodness. Hey, that's a really great question, actually. Audubon had plenty of birds that he resented or he, he didn't like, but I think I would, the, the most rhapsodizing description by Audubon is for hummingbirds. I think he couldn't get over uh, what a hummingbird was. He kind of thought it was a somewhere between an angel and a bird. He just was astounded. By them, and we'll get to them a little bit later in the presentation. Okay. Eliza, you like froze have... a little bit for me, but. Uh, Dr. Polad, it looks like we have a question from Jacqueline. Any insight into Audubon's relationship with indigenous people as he moved across the country? That's a great question too. He says the, the Native Americans he met, he admired them deeply actually. Um, and he imagined, you know, he, sometimes he had, was traveling with a 13 year old artist that helped him with his 
his plants, draw the pictures of the plants. But imagine in the wilderness of like Louisiana, Kentucky, eventually Arkansas, Missouri, you had to really negotiate people pretty well. He was a, a really charismatic guy. And he, he, um, he had incidents where he, he came across uh, escaped, runaway, enslaved people. And I can tell you at this point, Audubon uh, owned slaves um, from time to time when he could afford it. Uh, but then it stopped after a certain point. He didn't need, he didn't need um, uh, enslaved people any longer. But he, he admired the French trappers that he had met and the Native Americans deeply. They probably knew a lot, and that's what he might have admired. And we have a few more questions in the chat. Um, Liza, I don't know if you can see these as well, but uh, one from Stephen Harris. When did uh, John James Audubon die? And did he ever see photography? Oh, well, those, are, those are great questions. Um, I think he dies in 1851. Um, we'll see he eventually um, gets Alzheimer's, passes away from Alzheimer's, starts to lose his eyesight. Um, and I don't think he used photography as model models for his birds because that would have been in, in the 1840s. And photography comes to America in 1840, but only for portraits of people. They, there could have been no photographs of birds, but he might have used photographs for models um, for the last project, which was to show all the mammals of North America. I'm not, I'm not so sure about that, but his sons and he might have used photographs for that project. But yeah, 1851, he passes. And then Pam Sloan writes, was he a self-taught taught artist, taxidermist? And why did his wife sell the plates that you had mentioned? Those are great questions. As he was a self-taught artist at first, although he met some very famous artists, American artists, as he went east to Philadelphia and then to London. And um, as a taxidermist, he was more or less self-taught. But he started that way back in France. And then he got better as, um, as the years went on. I didn't, I didn't dwell on this. You, you might know he, he would wire up the dead birds with a wire frame, but, the, but everybody did that. Every bird artist did that. His gift was to do it so great, gracefully and in such a lifelike manner. But I think, yeah, he was good enough to be hired by a museum in Cincinnati to be a taxidermist. So, yeah. And then finally, one last question. Uh, as I was doing research on Audubon and consulting with others in the field, I thought of the question about Audubon's biography and his ancestry. I know you touched on his mother, um, but when I do research, I find a lot of inconsistent information about his mother's background. Do you know anything more about her uh, ancestry and what um, what her diversity and thereby, thereby Audubon's diversity um, would, would lend to our world today. For example, what if Audubon was considered as biracial? How would that impact the field today? Yes, and in fact, there are websites that um, on black history and black artists that kind of include him um, as a black artist or at least a mixed race artist. Um, but it's not clear. His mother was a French national who had gone to Haiti with um, the elder um, Audubon. Um, but, and so it's, it's not, there's, there's some debate about that. Um, but I have no, no trouble um, understanding Audubon as uh, Haitian you know, or as, as mixed race, or as um, from such a, a, a diversity of backgrounds. And, and actually most people thought he was Native American when he went to, to Europe and he didn't tell people otherwise. So I think there's enough Audubon to go around. I, I, I don't have any trouble with that at all. So, um, and in fact, what would we be looking for, you know, less than an eighth African-American or, you know, what would, 
Audubon helps us realize that, you know, maybe we don't need biology to, to, to put him in one category. We can think about his experience, which was incredible. Uh, world traveler, born in Haiti, Haiti, it's wonderful, you know, so. Mm -hmm. I will say, to be fair, um, not many people know that Audubon and his family own slaves. And that's, that's something for us to keep in mind too. That, that you know, we, we need to bear that in mind. And so, you know, it complicates things. Excellent. Well, I know we wanted to save time for you to uh, discuss where we could find more of these birds at the Nature Center. Would you like to uh, jump in? You bet. And I realize I have many more birds that I can cover. So if you'll forgive me, I'll jump around and cover some, uh, some really great ones, if you don't mind. Let's see here. Okay. We're here for you. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Great question. Uh oh, um, let's see here. Lisa. Yeah, we're not quite sure what happened here, but um, I'm, yeah, if, if we get you back on, I'm happy to jump back on. But uh, I'm happy to let people know a little bit more about where they can find the birds at the Nature Center, if that's okay with you, Mark. Um, I know everyone who goes to the Nature Center could speak to uh, where they see some of the birds at. I have a lot of luck around the ponds. Um, if you're happening to walk through the wetland area of the Nature Center, uh, you will see you will see so much biodiversity. You will hear the birds, the biophony, uh, and it's just so great to be surrounded by those um, by those rich resources and those sensory for us. Uh, and recently, I've seen the great blue heron mark had called right along the shoreline. Uh, we've also seen kingfishers, which looks somewhere between a woodpecker and a shorter stout bird, um, but they're great. They're fantastic to see around the, uh, the, the pond. And red-winged blackbirds. I don't know if you hear the beautiful song of the red-winged blackbird and you see the little yellow and red on their wings, but they fly around and uh, they make lots of noise and they're territorial. Red-winged blackbirds once as a kid dive bombed me, got their little claws into my hair um, because I was too close to their nest. I didn't know. And so that's one of the ones I love to hear sing and see. Um, Mark, you can call in. Gosh, we're so sorry that you are not, we can't hear your audio. Um, the Savannah for Warblers, uh, our director Amaris has mentioned. And oh, man, if you're there at the right time of year, in the Savannah, you may also see owls, uh, the great horned owls we've, met, we've seen in the Savannah before, which is just so fantastic. And when I saw this, uh, it was when Marjorie Priest was leading one of her bird walks and she and her group had, uh, met, had noticed it in October, the middle of October on a Saturday morning. Beautiful to see owls there. If you also walk around the waterfall area outside of the preserve, you will also notice that there may be owls in there too. We've heard a lot of good things about owls in there. Um, let's see. We would like to respect everyone's time. I know we have about three minutes left for this hour long um, program. So I would like to continue on here and, um, and just to thank Dr. Polad. If he comes back, we're happy to hear from him again. Um, but I'd like to say, it sounds like that Audubon had a historical impact on the study of birds. And it makes me think about how we will broaden our world view of environmentalism in the 21st century and what values we will carry on with us. What will we champion for? Um, as you could tell from Audubon's biography, there was a lot of stuff in there, for example, shooting all the birds that we wouldn't quite do these days. And so as you can see, times change and uh, we're excited to evolve and to continue to find um, our ever-changing community and find our voice in there. So I would like to uh, thank you all for joining us tonight.
And I'd like to remind you that this Saturday, May 9th, is a very big day for birders across the world. Uh, it's World Migratory Bird Day. And the Chicago Audubon is organizing the Spring Bird Count, a day when everyone goes outside and counts the birds they see. Whether you'll be enjoying birding at your favorite outdoor space or from the window of your home, it's a great time and a great opportunity to appreciate nature. And one way you can help collect data about birds is participating as a community scientist and using eBird. It's a free app or a website that allows you to submit your birding observations, which will record those observations from around the world. Um, and it's also a great at-home learning opportunity for people of all ages. It only takes about five to 10 minutes to do. You can find out more about eBird at eBird.org and the Chicago Audubon.org. Uh, help us to keep outdoor spaces open and safe. Bird wisely, not in flocks. Great blue herons, wingspan apart from each other. Uh, this presentation has been part of a new series called Bird Feed. Look for more programs like this one on Tuesdays at 6 p.m. Uh, next Tuesday, May 12th, the Chicago Audubon Society will be featuring another webinar titled Illinois Peregrines from Decline to Recovery with special guest speaker Mary Hennon, director of the Chicago Peregrine Program at the Field Museum. Uh, and she will take us through the recovery of peregrines in Illinois. Registration is required and you can register at chicagoaudubon.org. For more information about North Park Village Nature Center, visit chicagoparkdistrict.com, Chicago Park District's Facebook, and North Park Village Nature Center's Facebook, along with our YouTube channel. For more information about the Chicago Audubon Society, please visit chicagoaudubon.org. You can also find Chicago Audubon Society on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter by searching Chicago Audubon. I'd like to, uh, to thank Dr. Mark Polad of DePaul University, the Chicago Audubon Society, and North Park Village Nature Center for making this partnership possible. And finally, I'd like to thank you all, your viewers, and your uh, for participating tonight. What we're going to do is we're going to send you up a follow follow up email tomorrow with plenty more resources about birds, art, and ways to stay connected. We really appreciate you uh, taking the time to join us tonight, and we do apologize for these technical difficulties, but this is part of exploring this new frontier together. I thank you all very much for coming and I hope you all have a safe birding uh, experience in this migratory season. Thank you.